Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started in a couple minutes. Got a big crew today. Joe, do you know how many days it is until the holidays? Hmm, like two weeks, right? Um, if it's the eighth, and then <laughs> yeah, like about two weeks. It's kind of crazy. Forty-seven, forty-seven days until the uh, not thank, not American Thanksgiving. Oh, okay, okay. I was gonna say Thanksgiving. Um, oh, forty-seven days. That seems close, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Even better. They started giving it close, but yeah, they started carrying Christmas trees and. The Costco near me like last month. So the holidays are here in full swing. Okay. And in Michigan, I don't know what it's called, but there's a town that turns into like full Christmas. It's like on the edge of Detroit. Oh, we're going to have to go back. Back around the holidays. All right, we're up to 100, maybe start in but one more minute. Joe, why did you, why did you want to do, when we first started talking about this webinar, why did you want to do, like, where did this, where did this talking about pricing compression and discounts come from? Like, was it something that was happening internally with that you were talking about? Where did it come from? You inspired me with your pricing <laughs> compression series. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I think I, I always got a lot of questions when I was customer facing and about how to discount, how to run promotions, how to build a smart promotional calendar during the holidays. Um, so I think it's top of mind for everyone and it's important to review. Just like overall a lot okay. more awareness, I think, of like what we're yeah. doing in terms mm -hmm. of promotions. Yeah. Yep. Sure. All righty. I think let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to 12 Days of Not Discounting. I'm Joe Cullen, uh, Product Marketing Manager here at Headset. And I'm joined today by Krista Raymer founder and CEO of the Vitrina Group. And we're excited to talk about discounts today, um, especially as we head into the holiday season. But before we jump into any content, I just wanna remind everyone that we will have a live Q&A session following the webinar and Kristen and I will hang out for a little bit. So if you do have any questions, make sure to drop them in the chat feature in your Zoom toolbar. And um, yeah, we'll make sure to answer them in the Q&A session. All right, so what's on the agenda today? So after some brief introductions, we're going to provide some market context to help you understand the current state of the industry and kind of set expectations for this holiday season. We'll then dive into some discounting scenarios that you may encounter this season as a way to talk about some best practices and then if you snooze through that part, don't worry, we'll recap everything at the end with some takeaways and then wrap things up with a Q&A. Thanks. I do wanna briefly introduce Headset, especially for our newcomers. Um, and you may be looking at this slide thinking that this is a lot and it is, but if there's something to take away from this slide, it's that Headset is really a full spectrum analytics provider that um, can really serve as your one-stop shop, as your data hub, and help you make smarter decisions as you navigate this very complex industry. Now, with the holidays approaching, I know that many of you in the audience are likely in crunch mode. We really only have two weeks until Thanksgiving, um, and that's, you know, one of the biggest shopping days of the year. And that means that you're probably thinking about how to price your products, which promotions to run, which products to order and stock on your shelves. And part of that planning process is understanding what your competitors are doing and how you're positioned against them. We recently launched a new product called Bridge Signal, 
which sources online menu data to help you understand that competitive landscape. So if you're someone who, as part of your job, scrapes online menus to keep up with what's happening at the shop next door or to get a feel for how your competitors are pricing or packaging certain products, Bridge Signal is really going to help you automate that process and kind of simplify that. We recently took a survey of clients and found that cannabis operators on average are spending six hours per week scraping menus. And that's a lot of time and money that with Bridge Signal, you could invest in other aspects of your business. Um, and during today's presentation, we will be using Bridge Signal to help tee up those scenarios that I alluded to in the um, agenda um, that involve discounting. And then Krista will be joining us to offer some tips and tricks on how to approach those scenarios to make sure that you're building an effective holiday uh, strategy. Krista, do you want to give a little intro and talk about the Vitrina Group? Sure. Yeah. We um, started the Vitrina Group really because we came from traditional retail and hopped into cannabis when we saw an opportunity to optimize what was happening in the sales floor of retail stores. So we've worked with cannabis retailers across Canada and the U.S. as well as with brands to optimize pricing, inventory and assortment, uh, really plan uh, marketing calendars and promotional calendars, and just dig mm -hmm. into where we can drive more profitability at the store level. Um, so we became really tight friends with Headset because of that, because we really wanted to make sure that we are bringing the right level of data and making data-driven decisions in this environment. And it's super tough to do that um, because the data is a little all over the place because it's still so new. So um, we're super excited to be here. And I think it's with that data that we actually started um, a series around pricing compression. So Joe, does that pull us to the next part? Yeah, what is pricing compression? So one of the things that we've noticed um, that has happened in all markets as they legalized and then spent more time in the market is that prices start to compress. So where is that pricing compression coming from and what is the impact? Ultimately, we're seeing the pricing compression both at the wholesale and at the retail level. And supply and demand play a really big part of this. So the amount of excess inventory that is available and the way that we can sell it at wholesale influences the way that it can then sell at retail as well. In markets where we have seen pricing compression kind of like light on fire and become really impactful to the business, we see excess inventory in both the retail as well as the wholesale. So how do we get out of pricing compression? It's ultimately making sure that we have the right levels of inventory in both wholesale as well as in retail. And from a retail perspective, ensure that we aren't compressing like the penny profit or the gross margin that is left in the pricing. So we could have seen pricing compression pull into markets and not impact the retail level because the retailers could have just absorbed that additional um, gross margin in the way that they were acquiring their wholesale product. The reality is, is that we've seen a lot of competition. And so um, our ultimately retailers have looked to compete off of price. And that's uh, usually driven because our customers are price sensitive in the way that they're shopping. So we'll talk a little bit more about like pricing compression and what is impacting this mm -hmm. through specifically things like discounts. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's important to define that before we get into the content because we're going to be talking about pricing compression a lot. Um, all right. So I do want to set the stage before we talk about promotions and discount tactics. What is the current state of the cannabis industry and kind of what can we uh, look forward to or expect this holiday season? So this year, 2022, has obviously been a pretty turbulent time for our national and global economy. And though cannabis has shown to be more recession proof than other industries, we've definitely seen a reversal in the positive and somewhat unusual growth that we experienced during the COVID boom in 2020 and 2021. And as seen on the top graph here from a recent headset industry report, you'll notice that um, demand has softened compared to the previous years. But if we take a look back a bit further, we can still see that total sales this year are on track to outperform 2019. So the market over the long haul to give you a dose of optimism has grown. We're defining this recent softening as a market correction 
Um, and it's important to understand that context going into the holidays. Um, if we look at Canada and newer recreational markets like Michigan, for example, um, Michigan is actually growing quite quickly um, and Canadian markets are growing pretty steadily. That being said, the growth is most likely coming from the opening of new storefronts rather than from an increase in consumer demand. Um, when we exclude new stores from our analysis and look at same store growth, um, most growth rates are actually negative. And as a quick side note, um, all of the data that I'm referencing is directly coming from our industry reports, which you can always access for free on our website. Now this softening of demand or market correction, um, among many other variables like increased competition, has created an excess in supply. And as a consequence of that imbalance of supply and demand, prices have been dropping. Um, and they've been dropping across all markets. And many US markets, as seen in the graph here, the EQ price or the equivalized price, that's the price per gram. So when you go into a grocery store and you see the dollar per ounce under the peanut butter jar, that's the EQ price rather than ounces we're looking at grams here. So that price has dropped by 32% since January, 2021. So almost over two years. And flour is very indicative of what's happening overall, just given its predominant market share. So that's why we're focused on that category here. Um, and Canada, and I know Ontario's on this um, only, but in this uh, data point that I'm gonna reference, we, we looked at four different provinces. The EQ price of flour has dropped about 23% over that same uh, two year time frame. So now you're in a situation where you have to be that much more particular and intentional about the promotions that you run because you now have less wiggle room. And to reach the same sales targets as last year, for example, you're going to have to sell that much more products. Okay, so you're probably thinking um, this is semi-depressing. Is there any good news? Is there anything to look forward to the to this holiday season? And the answer is yes, um, there is. In U.S. markets, when we look at the top 11 days in terms of gross sales in 2021, five of those days actually occurred in Q4. So that's the quarter that we're in now, October, November, and December. Green Wednesday was the second highest day of sales and Black Friday was the third, um, making the Thanksgiving weekend, which is in just two weeks, um, a really critical holiday for cannabis retailers in the US. Um, in Canada, Q4 is equally important, minus the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, the week of Christmas is especially strong. Um, Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve Eve, the 23rd, were the biggest sales days in Q4 of last year. And we think that this year will likely behave in a similar way to last year. We may even see a larger increase in sales just given this year's uh, more relaxed COVID restrictions relative to last year. So all that being said, there are some really big sales days ahead of us um, to help kind of round out the year on a high note. Discounts are also high during the holidays. Um, so Black Friday had the highest increase in average discounts compared to the previous four weeks, rising from about 13 to 20%. And discounting in the Canadian markets is less significant. However, there is still a pretty noticeable bump during Christmas, uh, Boxing Day, and Green Wednesday. So Discounts are obviously an expectation that customers have when going into the holidays, but the question is, kind of the crux of this webinar is, how do we leverage discounts in a market where prices are dropping and sales are softening? How do we do that without compressing our prices even further and without hurting our bottom line? So hold on to that question, keep thinking about it because we're going to give you the answers in this next part. So. Using Bridge Signal, which I'm going to hop into, um, Krista and I are going to talk about three different scenarios that you'll likely encounter this holiday season when it comes to discounts and promotions, especially when thinking about how your store is positioned relative to your competitors. 
or those around you. And um, I'll be the one teeing up the scenarios and then Krista is going to talk about how you may want to approach each of those. All right, so in each of these scenarios, I will be playing the role of like a sales manager at a dispensary in Seattle where I oversee a lot of the pricing and discount strategy. I've got about five other stores within walking-ish distance of mine. So there's quite a lot of competition and I wanna know what's going on around me. How are my competitors pricing products? How are they discounting? How are they stocking their shelves? So I'm in our bridge signal demo account and this is called the activity feed. Um, it basically tells you all the recent events and updates at the stores that you've selected. And you can see that my filters are pre-selected to Washington and Seattle. And I'm then going to select my five uh, direct competitors or what I perceive as my direct competitors in this retailer filter. And I'm going to leave category and brand alone um, because I wanna see store-wide what's happening. And I'm gonna leave activity type to all and the Zoom toolbar is in the way. So I'm going to pull this up. Okay, I'm gonna press filter results. So this is everything that's happening at those stores um, from price changes to products removed, promotions. But in this first scenario, I wanna specifically focus on promotional activities. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to select promotions as my activity type. Just wanna narrow down the results. All right, so these are all the promotions that are happening at the five stores that I've selected. The one that's immediately standing out to me is the 20% off store-wide uh, sale at Dank Delights. This store is just a couple of blocks away from mine and I'm worried that the 20% off may be a big enough incentive for a customer of mine to walk next door and buy product at a cheaper price. So Krista, I'm looking to you what should I do in this situation? Should I counter with a similar store-wide promotion? Should I play dirty and go for 21%? Um, or should I just approach this in a completely different way? I think it's like really first important to know what the difference between discounts and promotions really are, right? A discount is used to be able to create a category of people um, and then change the price essentially for them as a group. So if we're looking at a store-wide discount of doing something 20% off, we usually see discounts that are also like 20% off maybe for new customers. That would be like a discount. A promotion is going to be something that we create to drive additional velocity in products and get those products sold. So what we're trying to do is say, we're going to increase the velocity of the products that we're selling by increasing the velocity. We're creating more opportunity for um, those gross margin dollars and by taking a slight reduction in what our gross margin dollars are, we're going to offset the cost of doing that by moving through enough product. So store-wide discounting is really hard. Usually customers aren't willing to totally change the way that they're willing to shop um, for, any, for a discount under 30%. So what does that mean? It means if we just do something like 20% off of the whole store, that might not actually be an instance where it is enough to attract new customers, but maybe just enough for our already engaged customers to shop with us again. So somebody who's already intending to shop with us might now just purchase slightly more. So we first want to think about what are the implications of doing a store-wide discount? We have two kind of core customers within an environment. We have our engaged customers that are part of our reoccurring purchasing rates. And then we have the customers that might shop with us infrequently. It could be because we are in a specific geography or it could be that somebody is shopping um, with us because uh, they've seen a promotion maybe somewhere on like lead maps. In both of these instances, handing off that additional gross margin across the entire store is incredibly difficult to do, especially at sustained rates. So if you haven't priced the product in store to be able to accommodate for that type of discount, say for example, at 20%, that's just gross margin dollars. Very rarely do we see enough velocity generated by a store-wide kind of promotion that is a 20% off to generate enough business to offset the cost of doing that. Now, some people would say, hey, that's the cost of customer acquisition. Once they've shopped with us once, they're willing and more likely to shop with us again. And I would say, yes, but also 
what happens when the customer perceives that everything in your store is valued less than maybe the other stores in the area? Is that going to be helpful? So the alternative is to actually look at doing very specific promotions off of specific products that we're trying to achieve. So by doing this and by being that specific, we can think about creating things like loss leaders. So highlighting a specific product that we already know has an engagement with the current customer base and bringing them in or attracting customers from potentially other retailers. So in an instance where you have a next door neighbor who might be doing 20% off of the entire store might make sense to go after doing a more specific product promo. And that product promo would be even better if the other retailer doesn't have it at all. So we can start to differentiate our offering around what our promotion looks like. We want to also think about what it looks like to highlight this information. For the most part, when we look at retailers and the way that um, they're dropping kind of promotions, we miss massive opportunities in the touch points that are leveraged to create awareness around that promotion. So your promotion should have touch points online, in-store, and as well as in-store should be with things like digital signage or physical signage, as well as training our bud tenders to be able to speak to these promos. So all of those are going to be really important when we're doing product specific promos. To be able to understand whether a promo like this is impactful, we need to make sure that we have a way to measure it. And so ensuring that we have a way to measure it looks like measuring the lift that the promo has created. So we need to have a, a good understanding of what our baseline is. So our baseline is going to be the average number of units that potentially fell in either a day or a week leading up to the promo. And then we want to measure what type of increase we've seen in the sell through of that product. So let's say, for example, it's a pre-roll. How many units a day do we sell? We get them to Thanksgiving and maybe we put it on promo. How many did we sell on the days that it was on promo versus our baseline leading up to that date? If we've seen a lift, then great. That is incredible because we've seen and generated some of the results that we wanted to. Then we need to measure it based off of our also our baseline overall. Did the whole store see a lift or did just that product? And so being able to understand what the baseline is of that product specifically in the way that is um, has grown as well as category specific insights, as well as store specific insights is gonna tell you if you've had an overall list. Perfect. Um, I do have another question too um, on that same activity type when I was filtering by promotions. Another promotion that caught my eye was the two for $22 select dabs. Um, I am considering replicating something like that, like some sort of bundle at my store, but I'm not sure if it's actually a good idea or how to put that bundle together. Um, what products to bundle, what price point to aim for? Do I do two or three for 30, 10 for uh, 50? Um, so I'm looking for some advice here, Krista. Yeah, you know, bundling is really interesting because it's perceived as really valuable from our customers. When we look at percentages as discounts, it's usually that moment where our customer is standing there in the store or they're asking the bud tender to be like, well, how much am I actually saving? The perceived value of getting a product for free is usually much higher than a discount percentage. So I quite like bundles as an option to create a promo because the perceived value is higher. Let's give a more specific example. We'll use pre-rolls because they're right here. But um, if we say 20% off of a pre-roll and it is $10, that reflects $2 worth of value. But what if we gave a pre-roll with a product and our wholesale cost on that might be less than $2, depending on what market you're in, price and compression. But um, in that instance, we might be able to get more into the hands of our customer. The perceived value is much higher than $2, but it actually has only cost us $2 to run. And so with bundling, there is an opportunity to think about the perceived value of product and what the customer is getting out of it. Now, there are two ways that we can be running bundles. There is one way to obviously generate more velocity. So try and get through more products sold in one transaction. The other way that is often being used right now 
is to get through slow moving inventory in large quantities. So let's say, for example, we have a large amount of um, vape cart inventory in store. It's becoming aging. We're at 30 or 60 days without it having any sales. And so now we're dropping like 10 or 15 carts, for example, for $100, one that I regularly see as a promotion right now. We need to think about the intended and unintended consequences of these types of promotions. So if we do um, 10 or 15 carts, for example, for $100, that pushes our customer out of the store for a long period of time, meaning that unless they're coming in to shop another product category, we probably have pushed them out of the store for at least a month, if not longer. And so we wanna think about how often do we want our customers purchasing and how much do we want them spending? So we might have seen like, the quick hit of cash associated with the 10 or 15 for 100, but the reoccurring rate to which they come back is much further down the line. And so can we actually see more value from having our customer shop more frequently, but maybe at slightly higher, lower basket sizes? So intended and unintended consequences are really important to start to weigh when we think about bundles specifically. So we need to be really, really careful with being intentional with these types of promotions, as well as set goals and where they could cannibalize other business. So are we potentially reducing our opportunity to cross sell across different categories because we're doing something that looks like bundling? Now, bundles are excellent option for impulse driven products. So what would an impulse driven product be? Probably those products that sit, depending on your pricing sensitivity in your market, anywhere between $15 and $25 are usually going to be easy to understand. So like drinks, edibles, pre-rolls would all fall into this impulse driven category and thinking about creating something that maybe as an entire bundle gets added to another transaction. So where possible, um, depending on what you're trying to solve for, and um, if our inventory is under control and we want to see repurchasing rates more frequently, I like to stay away from bundling products that is too large of format, meaning like I'm going to try and avoid bundling an ounce with an ounce, but I might bundle an ounce with a pre-roll. And that would be because the customer's perception of the value of the pre-roll is much higher than if we had just said 20% off of the ounce. So um, understanding what is going to help drive the customer behavior, understanding what is important to them, and also the intended and unintended consequences are going to be um, really important. So with bundles, one of the things that we want to do is to measure the long-lasting impact. So if we go in and make, say, for example, two edibles for the price of or three edibles for the price of two, as an example, we've just undercut the value of the product. And so depending on how long we've run it, we could be telling and indicating to our customer what the value of the edible is in long term, and it might be difficult to sell them at full price after that. So it's something that we need to be aware of specifically with bundling. Perfect. I think that's a good segue into our next scenario, which is around seasonal inventory. I'd be curious on your thoughts uh on the opportunities uh to bundle seasonal products whether those are more considered more impulse buys but um in bridge signal another activity type that you can filter by is product added so aside from having competitive promotions i also want to make sure that i have a comparable selection of products as my competitors especially around the holidays when those seasonal products are, are pretty popular they're good they make good gifts so I'm going to filter by this product added filter and I can see that Bustin Canna has got a pumpkin spice cookie. Um, Cannabis Depot just got in a pumpkin pie flower product, uh, creme, creme brulee, popcorn nuggets at Dink Delights and first of all, everybody loves weed. So people are stocking up on seasonal inventory. I do want to be competitive, but I also don't want to end up with a bunch of seasonal products after the holiday that I'll likely have to discount. So Krista, my question one, what are your thoughts on seasonal products? And two, how do I avoid trapping myself into a situation where I have to mass discount those products once the holidays kind of wind down? 
Yeah, you know, seasonal products are excellent because they can create diversity and a sense of newness within your inventory assortment. Um, but the problem with uh, seasonal products is that the once the season has passed, they become extra irrelevant very quickly. So for example, when you have inventory and it's held in store for a longer period of time, the value of that product decreases over time. And so maybe we get to 30, 60 or 90 days and it's slow moving and now we're gonna take an action to get it out. Seasonal products, and like my favorite example is Halloween candy as well as uh, Valentine's Day cards and candies, is if you look at the store selling it, they sell it at full price and then the moment that the holiday is over, even the day of the holiday, the price is slashed. And that's because the product becomes completely irrelevant the next day after the holiday. And so we have to be really careful in avoiding over-purchasing irrelevant inventory. Now, one of the ways that we can do that is to look and do an analysis of how much we think we can move through on a day-to-day -day of a seasonal product, for example, and then be able to forecast out how long we should have it. By creating a forecast of this, we could then measure if we are on track or off track and start to pull levers accordingly. So let's say, for example, we want to bring in um, candy cane hot chocolate that is like an infused product. We need to sit back and say, how many do we think we could sell per day? How long are we planning to carry it in store? That's going to tell us the amount of inventory. And then halfway through that period, we should be sitting back and saying, are we on track or off track? If we're on track, great. Maybe we need to make a repurchase. If we are off track for that period, do we need to create a promotion to highlight this product, which could be like signage, it could be extra bud tender training, it could be that we are actually building some type of um, financial incentive for the customer to purchase it, that could be a discount or a promotion a bundle activity, for example. All of these are going to tell us if we're getting there. That way we can avoid getting to the holiday and still having a lot of excess inventory that we need to get through and move through after the period. So specifically around holiday, we don't really want to get to um, New Year's and still have all of these flavors that we would traditionally associate with holiday, for example. So we've got to be really specific with the amount of inventory that we bring in. We need to be thinking about building a forecast for how much we can sell. And then we need um, to really monitor and know whether we're on track or off track. With seasonal inventory, it's super important that we aren't creating duplication of SKUs. So if you want to bring in a product, say, for example, like a pumpkin spice flavored vape cart, we should only really be bringing in one option to service that type of customer. So it's really important that we sit back and say, with any of those seasonal inventory pieces, do we already have a product that services our customer in this way? So do we have, do we need two different types of candy cane chocolate or is just one going to suffice? Um, being able to make those hard decisions and keep things so that we don't have duplication of SKUs is a really great way to help keep our overall kind of like inventory and SKU count down. Perfect. Great. So after going through all of those scenarios, um, Krista, what are the takeaways that you would tell someone like me as a retailer, uh, as a pretend retailer, um, when approaching the holidays for the season? So we have to be super intentional with the way that we build promos. We need to set the goals and then we need to measure whether they are being effective or not. And we need to also not just look at the data behind this, we need to look at the qualitative information that goes along with it. So there's quantitative and qualitative feedback loops that need to happen. Quantitative are going to be us measuring the lift in promotion. It's going to be measuring the skew velocity, for example. Um, it's also going to be measuring how much money we made off of these promos. The qualitative feedback is getting specifically looking to, for example, our loyal customers, see if they found value in it. Um, different customers in different regions are going to find value from different things. Sometimes a $2 in savings is an excellent savings for some communities and in other places that wouldn't matter. And so understanding what our customer sees and where they find value is going to be a really important step. We also should be running product specific promotions and back out of 
full store promotions, even category wide promotions. In both of these instances, we're just handing gross margin back to the customer where we actually have an opportunity to create higher velocity in potentially particular products. By being that specific, we can price, we can create assortment that, be, that is supporting those efforts as opposed to just doing it category wide. Sometimes what we see is category wide promotions with a list of exclusions. You're much better just to say, this is the promo listed and these are the products that it's relevant to. Makes the um, perception of choice for the customer as opposed to making it feel like something is being taken away. Um, we need to be able to measure the lift of a promotion. So what is our baseline of a product, for example, and then how has it impacted? And also if there's been any cannibalization in the business. So if we have had unintended consequences. So for example, if I'm selling um, some hot chocolate, has that actually taken away from our edible chocolate sales? Maybe, um, we wouldn't know unless we had a baseline of um, the edible sales before took a look at where we created additional velocity, for example, with our um, hot chocolate and then measured and said, did our, did our chocolate bar sales stay the same? And then we want to also be taking into account skew rationalization. This is important all year round, but it's really, really, really important when we're gonna bring in seasonal skews is we should be thinking, okay, where do we have some one-off skews that are left in store that we can focus on getting out, bring in some seasonally relevant um, inventory and then be able to also work through getting that inventory out as quickly as possible. So like four big, really big things to grasp, but ultimately it's really yeah. going to be about measuring the impact and the effectiveness of a promo and then being able to iterate and, and knowing what your customer is doing. Then you can say, I don't want to necessarily match that, but I want to be competitive in a way that works for like the financial goals of my business. Yeah. Um, and I guess um, we can talk about this in the Q&A session, but I am curious to hear your thoughts on 12 days of discounting, which is actually something that I had former retailers do. Um, yeah. I'm sure you have many, many thoughts on that, but um, yeah. 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 So I like, I think that's a really fun and easy one to address right off the top. And it's because of the amount of work that it takes to run a really great promo. If we're able to turn on a promo really quickly overnight, we probably aren't supporting the promo enough. Meaning that if it's really easy for us to run through 12 different promos um, and we can kind of like revolutionize and change the store each of those times, then um, that probably is a promo that isn't as effective as it could be. So we should be thinking about running a promo for a longer period of time than just one day. Because if we're running it just for one day, we're creating a very small number of customers who might be willing to access or who could access it for whatever reason. So part of running a really effective promotion is about creating multiple touch points for a promotion. Where possible, seven is a really great number. Um, and so you need to sit back and say, where can I create seven touch points? I can create seven touch points through utilizing things maybe like Weed maps, our own duchy or online menu, for example. Uh, we want to create in-store signage. We want to create an in-store display. We want to create signage that additionally lives at the cash register. Maybe we've sent a, a text or an email campaign to our customers. And then maybe there's even a bag stuffer that goes in after. So that would be seven different touch points. To be able to do that every single day is really tough. So by creating a longer period of time, gives us some room to be able to access these seven different touch points to run a promotion, as well as it gives us more likelihood and a larger reach of customers that we can go after to be able to attract and bring them in. So lengthening out that amount of time. Now, that's not going to be relevant for everything. Uh, there are certain holidays, for example, Black Friday, where our customers are conditioned through other purchasing in other industries to shop just for the day. So it isn't kind of like equally applied to everything, but 12 days of promotions leading up to the holidays could definitely be optimized, for example. Perfect. Um, I think we'll have an opportunity to ask um, many more questions in our Q&A, but before we close out, I do wanna mention that 
we are running a holiday special on Bridge Signal uh, for all webinar registrants. We're offering you guys your first month free. Um, and if you are interested in a demo or more information on uh, pricing, just respond to the recap email that you'll receive with the recording, or you can head over to our website and fill out a demo request form. All right, um, I think we'll open it up to questions. And I know Cole is behind the scenes managing the Q&A. Um, yeah. You know, Joe, I think if there's something else that we yeah. should be touching on specifically with promos, and it's like we've talked about some of the promos that live and exist independently, kind of like leading up to the holidays, but ultimately these all mm -hmm. roll into a promotional calendar. And so it's yeah. like important for us not only to kind of zoom out when we think about um, what promo we're running and the intended and unintended consequences, but also how those promos line up the side by side or at the same time, for example. And so by creating a calendar that is linked to um, different times of the year, we can drive different like holistic narratives. And so when we're talking about creating touch points, that's where you can start to see some efficiency in saying, okay, here are my mm -hmm. consistent touch points and building a promotional calendar and being like, what needs to run when and how? Like we might not wanna run a bundle deal and a bundle deal, one type of edible and another type of edible week after week, there might be some opportunity yep. to create variance and difference. And also think about like what is seasonally happening for our customers at that time. And so um, pulling all of this into a promotional calendar that looks at what is happening on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, quarter-to-quarter basis is super important. Yep, for sure. Um, Okay, so um, it looks like Bob has a question about whether or not, I think this question about whether or not we're seeing not only pricing compression, but are we also seeing margin compression in these markets? Um, and we are releasing a pricing compression industry report, um, should be later this week or next week, so look out for that. But in general, um, retailers are actually not sacrificing margin to lower retail prices, what we found. Um, cost of goods and, and price are, are going down at actually the same rate, which could imply that producers are the ones that are feeling the competitive pressure um, and dropping prices more than retailers are. So all of that, um, there's more information in our industry report, which will drop later this week. Um, but it's a good question. Yeah, um, I think this is also not necessarily always felt equally, depending on geography where right. we are. Um, because a big part of whether the retailer is experiencing um, gross margin compression would also be about if they're changing their prices and changing their prices to try and remain competitive. So um, there's a little bit about here in gross margin, but there's also an opportunity here to think about um, gross margin from a whole store level, but also gross margin from a product level, which actually becomes a much mm -hmm. bigger part of a pricing strategy at the retail level. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, pretty open-ended question, but and I think we obviously touched on this during the presentation or you did Krista, but how long should I run a promotion? It sounded like seven days, maybe kind of a sweet spot. Um, I would take one step back even further and yeah. say, what is the okay. intention of running the promo? So are we, um, trying to be seasonally relevant? Are we trying to get through some slow moving inventory? Are we trying to capture new customers' attention? Um, a lot of the time people would be like, all of the above. And I would say all of the above is really hard to build into one promo. So taking one step backwards mm -hmm. before we even get to how long it should run for, but being like, what's the intention of running this promo? Because that will give us some hints. If we're running through slow moving inventory, we want to do it as quickly as possible, get it in, get it out. If we are wanting to be seasonally relevant, it could mean that we run it for a slightly longer period of time. Yep. Um, there's been a couple of questions around like regulation, barring, mm -hmm. bundling. Um, yeah. And so for, for those states that can't 
bundle, um, mm -hmm. I guess um, going off of Allison's question, how could you do a larger perceived value to customers with them simply percentage discounts? So I guess how can yeah, you like so replicate that same perceived yeah. concept? Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the ways that you can do this is actually to provide signage and very clear dollars saved. Um, so mm -hmm. instead of leaving the customer to stand there and do the math and, and make an assessment of value, help them with more under, uh, information to identify what exactly the promo means to them. So for example, instead of $20 or 20% off of a pre-roll or a previous example, you could just say $2 off. Um, that's going to help the customer get to um, doing that value assessment much faster, which all, often is really supportive. I totally um, understand that a lot of the time bundling is actually lives outside of the regulations state by state or province by province. The thing about bundling is it's not always that it needs to be like a BOGO or like a three for the price of two mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, there is a lot of opportunity in just suggestive selling too. So um, bundling could also be about putting products together that make sense and running unique prices on both of those within that market for that day that individually they could be purchased, but more frequently they get purchased together. And so that wasn't very clear. So let me kind of sign seal and deliver this one. But in a, we, we worked with a retail group, for example, in a um, tourist based location. Weren't able to do bundling based off of local um, requirements for compliance purposes. But instead, what we did was cr we created signage. So the edibles were $7 each. And so we created signage that was two for 14. Individually, the edibles were still $7. We signed the product as $7 individually. And then we, but we created this promo sign that was two for 14. More frequently, we saw edibles be purchased in pairs of two. Um, we didn't have to do any specific bundling. All we did was create a promotion that we could sell to for the price of $14. In this example, um, basically what we're doing is suggestive selling. And so we gave the tools both to the bud tender as well as to the customer to understand like what the value of having two might be. And so you could think really specifically about how these products get purchased by doing a basket analysis in your own store. So understanding what products or what categories most frequently get purchased together, and then potentially running very specific pricing that allows you to create signage that um, kind of like easily helps the customer understand. So it's not as simple in as going into a state where you can do bundling, um, but it is definitely a workaround. And honestly, half the time promotions are just about creating awareness for our customer that there is an option to shop in that way. It's just suggested selling. Talking about awareness, um, I'm curious how, and Edgar posed this question, how long before a promote Pro promotion should we be advertising it like what how long should we be like hyping this promotion up before the promotion is actually running so one of the unintended consequences of um, hyping a promo too early is that we freeze purchasing in the in between it's the same kind of like hangover effect that we see after a holiday so sometimes when we run a lot of promos specifically on a holiday, the day after or the couple days right after, we see a decrease in purchasing. Um, it's we've, We saw it at 420, we saw it at 4th of July, for example. Um, and so we actually want to think about what we're promoing and how early we're talking about it as saying, do, could that impact our sales in the meantime? So the promo on, for example, a uh, holiday coming up, we might want to leverage it to get some products sold that we maybe weren't going to sell anyways. So you could do something like um, we have these edibles and we're going to have them get them while they're here. Um, we don't usually carry them. We're going to hype up the promo um, and then sell those products for that are seasonally relevant for the, for the desired amount of time. So I'll give a better example would be like, if we always, if your customer reoccurringly purchases um, gummies, we might do a promo off of chocolates because it's also very relevant to the holidays. 
And what we would do is we could talk about that earlier with the assumption that maybe we aren't going to sell chocolate, like we don't have chocolates available to the customer in the in-between. Um, and we're going to create additional velocity that maybe we don't usually see in that category. So we're going to take advantage of opportunities to highlight and amplify without retracting from our gummy sales because our customer is already willing to purchase gummies and they already have a pattern of purchasing them. Does that answer so the question? Sure. Of... I think it does, um, okay. but we can, Edgar can chat in if he uh, feels otherwise. Uh, but I'm curious um, what your thoughts are on uh, regarding discounting from a brand's or producer's perspective. And it looks like so is Allison. Um, we have focused a lot on retail specific discounts, but what advice would you give to producers on seasonal discounts um, or yeah, I guess from the brand's perspective. Yeah, from a brand perspective, it's like, what are we trying to achieve and who are our partners that we can get it done with? Um, right now, it's really interesting, like dealing with brands from a retail perspective and vice versa. There's a lot of brands now starting to have a conversation about how do we keep our pricing integrity and partner with groups that aren't going to come in and kind of like, aggressively undercut our prices um, because we want to see our prices held at a certain amount within the market because of perceived value of them. So assessing our partners and who we're running promos with, as well as like having that conversation with your retail partners about what they're doing is really like a first and foremost step. Second step is to say like, where does your product fall within a, a um, promotional calendar? So are you super relevant during the holidays? Can we leverage it to increase the velocity? And if, if so, then great, like let's really dig in. If holidays aren't as relevant to our business and we don't think that we're going to see a retraction, then um, you can also stay the course. So there's this fine line between creating velocity and this decreasing our price where we get to a pinnacle where it's just like at some point it actually makes more sense to sell less units but at a higher gross margin. And so the mm -hmm. same thing can be said for brands as well is you need to take an assessment and saying what's our threshold, like what's our apex moment of when it makes more sense to maintain our prices and how much additional velocity can we really push. So for a brand, it's about finding the right vendors to um, partner with in terms of like retailers that are gonna help to drive the intention of what you're trying to do with promotions or where your product might live within um, within either their assortment or live within the customer's perception uh, and relevance around different holidays. Got it. Yeah, very contingent on the relationship that they have. Um, um, let's see. I think, yeah, Sarah has a really great question around timing. And I think the answer may, again, be um, kind of what's the intention of, of the promotion that you're trying to run. but. Her question is thoughts on whether or not you should go bigger when you know you're going to have a busy day, um, like Green Wednesday or Black Friday, or is it better to do some of those promotions on slower days to bring people in when they aren't traditionally shopping? You know, um, what we found when we did an analysis of um, daily deals. So at one point it was like super trendy and cool within the industry to do daily deals where you may be sold to different categories each day of the week. And mm -hmm. like there's still some of that that exists. Um, but what actually just meant is oftentimes your loyal customers. So those customers who are the most engaged are usually the ones that take advantage of daily deals. So instead of, for example, your customer who was purchasing flour and shopping maybe consistently on Friday, if you dropped a flour promotion on Tuesday, they just started shopping on Tuesday and spending slightly less money. Like, and so understanding how the promotions are impacting um, the customer purchasing behavior is going to be the first thing. So um, you can do like small tests. Um, these small tests will help you to identify as I did we add new customers? Did we see repurchasing rates? Did we see a retraction of like who our regular customer was on one day and move them over to another day? If all of those things were happening, we would want to kind of like step back and take a bigger picture. 
whenever you have like a big holiday, you have usually more eyeballs. Um, and so you have more customer awareness around this. And so there is an increased opportunity to, um, to leverage that moment. So I'll use an example. If we have slow moving inventory and we drop a promotion on Tuesday, it's only going to see so many customers. And so our likelihood of success is going to be lower than if we drop it, for example, on a Thursday or Friday. So it's about the intention and what we're trying to do. If we're trying to create additional sales just on Tuesday, are we doing it at the cost of pulling the sales out of another day? Um, or is it that we are not being efficient with our staffing schedule and we just need to make some staffing adjustments to support our store better? So um, that question isn't so easy without having like much more, a lot more specific details. But overall, um, just taking a promotion and dropping it into a day that is less busy usually has a lot more unintended consequences than what was, I think, initially believed. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Um, I'm curious, and it looks like Holly is too, around whether or not um, you've ever encountered a promo where there's been a draw, um, like put your name in the hat and then they'll draw the winner um, on a certain day. Um, Holly's question is how long should they run that promotion? But um, I get, yeah, again, I think we've, we've kind of answered that around intention, but um, and what are you know, the goals of that specific promotion? Yeah. With that one, actually, what you could do, mm -hmm. I, I don't, without knowing everything, um, but just with that very limited information, what you could do is if you have a loyalty program or you have an avenue to understand how frequently your customers purchase, I would be looking to analyze and say, okay, so what we know usually is that, um, 70% of your revenue is going to come from about 30% of your customers or the 80, 20 rule typically is pretty true. So of your top 20 or 30% of customers who are usually going to be the ones that are going to put it, themselves into a draw anyways, how frequently are they shopping? So if they're shopping every seven days, every 22 days, every 35 days, um, catching them so that they do like one or two transactions in that period would be probably the right amount of time for a draw like that. So um, catching them twice in store and then catching them so that they are then kind of coming in on their third, what would usually be their third purchase would be a great way to keep them engaged um, and drive uh, some retention along the way. All right. <clears throat> we only got two more minutes left. Um webinar i think what we'll do is we'll likely round up the questions that we didn't answer and uh send a little blog post um in our follow-up or in our recap email but i guess we have time for maybe one more um so christy you did, you did touch on this but spencer um asks about restrictions and manitoba not allowing two for one or like conditional promotions um anything that is seen as an inducement is against law do you have recommendations on how to work around that to still capitalize on busy sales days so i think you kind of answered that earlier but um anything quick any quick last notes to add um yeah so with that one it would be um in the the definition of an inducement can be tough because it's mm -hmm. uh it's not super clear all the time and definitely in markets like mansion it's not very clear but um what you can do is change the price so instead of saying two for 14 for example they're both independently eligible to be sold at seven dollars you're just creating a sign that says two for 14. Mm. so it would be about changing the price and then identifying for the customer what value the change in the price has had so um old price $10 new price, $8. Um, we aren't saying that there is like, it's in, in de it's dependent on the purchase of another thing. We're not saying that um, it's like a door crasher. All we're trying to do is help the customer, customer make an assessment of value faster. Um, and that has been a way that we have worked within those types of regulations, but still created good things for the customer. 
just like a little helpful tip and trick um, is that when you're putting any numerical numbers on pricing signage within a store, whatever you can do to keep the money symbol smaller than the numbers is really helpful, um, as well as making sure that words are larger than the numbers. So the bigger the price, mm -hmm. like the font size, um, the more attention it's going to grab. And sometimes you want that and sometimes you don't. So sometimes it's also about playing with the signage, um, but in most instances, like shrinking the money symbol a little bit smaller than the regular size font of like the numbers is helpful. Um, makes the customer feel like they're spending less money for some reason, psychology. Uh, but then also being aware of like, do we want that big number to stand out? Is it such a small number that we're excited about it? And so it should stand out. So I'm um, thinking about font size and the way that these promotions get displayed in store is also really uh, important. Awesome. Yeah, I think if, for more of those tips and tricks, which we love, um, you can uh, find Krista on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also reply to our email. You can email them directly at info at vitrinagroup.com. Um, but we'll be sending a recap email shortly with the recording and with the answers of those unresolved questions. And I think that concludes the 12 days of not discounting. So thanks everyone for joining and um, happy holidays. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, Joe, as always, what a pleasure. And if you do have other pleasure. questions, please reach out. We're happy to um, see what we can do to get some of those answered. Sweet. All right. Thanks, y'all. Bye. And stop. <laughs>